Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. What an amazing venue, isn't it? Wow. I don't think anybody else has sat on these seats. Um, can, you, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Okay, and it's wonderful, I, I think, to welcome WHO as co-sponsors of this conference, and I have high hopes that we will be able to uh, help, that you will be able to help us in facing up to the challenges of overdiagnosis. So, why are we afraid of normal? Or to turn the question upside down, why are we so keen to rush to diagnosis, to classify and to label people as abnormal, convinced of our own rightness? What is a diagnosis and who decides? What is normal? And whose normal is normal? Why do we treat diagnoses as if they were more real than the experience of our patients? Why have we allowed our notion of diseases to become separated from our understanding of illness and suffering? I'm getting a buzz. Can you get mm -hmm. well, I hope it goes away. Um, why, and, and why do we put so much more trust in numbers? rather than in the detail of symptoms. And how does this all, all this relate to neoliberal economics and its result in politics? And perhaps these are all aspects of the same question. Doctors don't seem to like normal, and we seem constantly to be extending the scope of our diagnostic labels. And if we can't manage to find a diagnosis we can always resort to identifying one of the countless risk factors for future disease, such as early pre-diabetes. And as we do all these things, we rush to fulfill the forebodings of the marvelous of the marvelous Michel de Montaigne, when he said. If they do no other good, they do at least this, <coughs> that they prepare their patients early for death, undermining little by little and cutting off their enjoyment of life. <coughs> he had it so right. We are living longer than ever before, enjoying unprecedented levels of physical health, and yet perceive ourselves to be ill. And this surely must have something to do with the insistence of preventive medicine and the constant injunctions to look out for the early symptoms of disease and to accept screening tests. And this situation is only worsened by the rise of big data and so-called <coughs> precision medicine. It's a new definition of precision. The task of defining a normal population becomes even more challenging. Who should define normality and using which criteria? The challenge of dichotomizing the continuum of biology into normal and abnormal seems exemplified for me in the microscopic examination of surgical pathology. Surgical pathologists are aware of the difficulty of providing an unambivalent distinction between normal and pathological tissues, especially when they examine borderline lesions. The history of diagnosis of such lesions is a visual ambiguity. And in practice, numbers are proving to be no less slippery and ambiguous. It seems to me that the definition of normal may be part of what Seamus Heaney, the poet Seamus Heaney, described as those arrangements which are offered as truth by powers, window dressers everywhere. And the normal in medicine seems to retreat even more rapidly in the increasingly common context of fragmented rather than relationship-based care, in the face of a lack of shared understanding, exposure to the medical industrial complex, rules-based care, paid <coughs> performance, and screening, case finding, and the pressure for earlier and earlier diagnosis. And as we search ever more carefully for abnormality, we somehow lose sight of the importance of being and feeling normal. And we begin to see abnormality everywhere. As the sociologist Sigmund Bauman might put it, abnormality self-corroborates. Bauman wrote, the image we hold of each other, a 
and of all of, of all of us together, has the uncanny ability to self-corroborate. People tra treated like wolves tend to become wolf-like. People treated with trust tend to become trustworthy. What we think of each other matters. People who are treated as abnormal tend to become abnormal. And at the same time, we have managed to invert normality completely so that the most normal aspect of human existence, dying and death, has been recast as the ultimate of abnormalities. In his great novel about the terrors of AIDS, of the AIDS epidemic, John Berger wrote, we're living on the brink, and it's hard because we've lost the habit. Once everybody, old and young, rich and poor, took it for granted. Life was painful and precarious. Chance was cruel. On feast days, there were brioche. And he continued, for two centuries, we believed in history as a highway which was taking us to a future such as nobody had ever known before. We thought we were exempt. When we walked through the galleries of the old palaces and saw all those massacres and last rites and decapitated heads on platters, all, all painted and framed on the walls, we told ourselves we had come a long way. Not so far that we couldn't still feel for them, of course, but far enough to know we'd been spared. Now people live to be much older. There are anaesthetics. We've landed on the moon. There are no more slaves. We apply reason to everything. We forgave the past its errors because they occurred in the dark ages. But now suddenly we find ourselves far from any highway, perched like puffins on a cliff edge in the dark. This is the normal situation, to be perched like puffins on a cliff edge in the dark, facing death. And so where does this, all this leave the patient and the clinician? This is the already mentioned Sigmund Bauman, who died in January last year, age 91, um, declining some of the predictions of the uh, terrible effects of his continuous life smoking. And he, Bauman knows all about the puffins on the cliff. We are abhorred by the flashes of reality <coughs> we have chased down into the no-go cellars of our orderly and elegant existence, having proclaimed them non-existent, or at least unspeakable. Death is just one of those things that have been so evicted. Hence embarrassment, the trained emotion of shame that makes us dumb when we, when we meet death face to face. <clears throat> I can stop eating eggs, refrain from smoking, which of course you never do, do physical exercises, keep my weight down. I can do so many other things as well. And while doing all these right things and forcing myself to abstain from the wrong ones, I have no time left to ruminate over the ultimate futility of each thing I'm doing, over the somber and potentially incapacitating truth that however foolproof each measure I take could be made, this does not in the least detract from the uselessness of them all put together. The existential worry can be now all but forgotten in the daily bustle about health. <clears throat> the daily bustle about health, I, I, I think that describes the life inside and outside the clinic. And it is this profound existential worry that drives the systematic but ultimately futile erosion <coughs> of normal. Clinical practice attempts to braid together two very different strands, the discoveries of biomedical science and the vagaries of life experience. These two strands have very different characteristics. Biomedical science aspires to be clear, reliable, reassuring, and certain, whereas life experience is frequently messy, unpredictable, frightening, and uncertain. Too often biomedical science persists with the metaphor of the body as a machine that can be fixed, whereas life experience tells us that the body is continually reacting, adapting, 
and changing in response to subjective experience. And the subjective experience of the clinician matters as well, as does the intersubjective relationship between the patient and the clinician. Doctors are neither passive recipients of, nor simple conduits for, clinical evidence. So which metaphor is delusional and which a reality? And within all these contradictions and incompatibilities, <coughs> the patient and the clinician struggle to find a sense of normal and abnormal that has meaning for them in the given context. Biomedical science mandates technical transactional care, while approaching the complexities of life and suffering depends on relationship-based care. For me, this wonderful Copenhagen statue by Charles Moserholm okay, reflects the imbalance in contemporary clinical medicine. We have lost sight of the apparently unsupported link. Lost sight of the importance of recognizing and talking about mess, unpredictability, and uncertainty. About the central importance of human relationships in all clinical work. And we try to suppress our fears by seeking refuge within the putative certainties of the apparently <coughs> well-grounded leg of biomedical science. In his great play Translations about the anglicisation of Irish culture and the suppression of Irish language in the early 19th century, Brian Friel writes, It can happen that a civilization can be imprisoned in a linguistic contour which no longer matches the landscape of fact. And sometimes I feel that the work of clinicians has become trapped within a linguistic contour of guidelines and targets and bureaucracy, which excludes too many words that are absolutely essential to the care of real patients. Person, relationship, thought, judgment, nuance, doubt, let alone courage, suffering, <coughs> joy, anguish, hope, and despair. This is the diagram I invented back in 1995. This is an incredibly simplistic diagram of one who always uh, condemns simplisticness. Anyway, I invented this back in 1995 to try and make sense of my experience of general practice. And I, I used it to describe through three crucial interfaces. Now, can I make it do something clever? Probably not. You have to point it up there. That's a good one. Do you want me to put it down? Doesn't matter. This bit. Ha! Got it, got it, got it. Okay. This is the first interface. This is the one that is crossed as stressful life experience becomes expressed as symptoms of illness. And then this is the absolutely crucial one. Um, this is the uh, interface between subjective symptoms of illness and the categories that biomedical science recognises. And this is the unimportant one, really, between disease requiring generalist and specialist treatment. As far as every diagnosis is concerned, this is the important one. Illness is one of the very few valid outlets for human distress. And if such illness is, inter is wrongly interpreted as a disease, <coughs> as in overdiagnosis, all kinds of damage can be done as I am sure we will learn much more about as this conference unfolds. Most people understand the logic of this progression, with fear exacerbated, um, with, e with the crossing of each interface. And one of the problems with screening, is when we screen those who feel well, is that they may find themselves plunged directly into disease with no preceding illness to help them make sense of and adjust to their new predicament of abnormality. They're just dropped in it. And somehow, for me again, this echoes the wisdom of the American writer Rebecca Solnit. Actions often ripple far beyond their immediate objective. And remembering this is a reason to live by principle and act in hope that what you do matters. <laughs> And in her 2014 New Yorker essay on Virginia Woolf, 
So, sonnet writes, the tyranny of the quantifiable <coughs> is partly the failure of language and discourse to describe more complex, subtle, and fluid phenomena, as well as the failure of those who shape opinions and make decisions to understand and value those slipperier things. It is difficult, sometimes even impossible, to value what cannot be named or described. And so the task of naming and describing is an essential one in any revolt against the status quo of capitalism and consumerism. The constraint of our lingui linguistic contour and our analysis of it is part of this process. There are benefits to both the individual and to society of holding that border, that red border between subjective illness and the disease categories recognized by biomedical science, of confining people within those categories only when such diagnostic label, labeling will be positively useful to them, and of deliberately minimizing exposure to the harms of medical technology. Healthcare professionals have been complicit in the erosion of normal. Is there now a role for us all in the robust defense of its importance? Thank you very much. Thank you.